Okay, our, uh, our next speakers are, uh, let's see, we've got uh, Rick Gilbert and Ted Wade. Does, uh, and they're going to look at uh, observation technique training. Uh, we mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier. This is really a critical piece of, uh, of, of information that you want to pass on to all your staff members. I remember talking to uh, some of the Hershey Park folks, some of the security personnel. And what they mentioned to me was uh, before anybody steps foot into Hershey Park, they actually are being observed at least four or five times before they actually set foot into the park. And, and they're all talking to each other. And, and what are they looking for? They're looking for things that are just a little bit abnormal. Uh, and, and by that I mean when you call the police because of an assault, uh, police love when, when they hear this, uh, can you describe the person? He's about medium, medium height, medium weight. And, and that's... <laughs> And that really nails it down. So I think these guys are going to give you a little bit more information to kind of help your staff members, your volunteers, to, uh, to, to pick up on, on some of these uh, specific nuances. Uh, and you'll see they'll walk out of here with a little bit of a different uh, perspective. Uh, and Rick began, began his career in 1993 serving as a police officer for the Lindeboro, New Hampshire Police Department, obtaining the position of sergeant. It was during his time there that Rick served as supervisor for the International Security Team Program at the 1996 Olympic Summer Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Alongside law enforcement officers from around the world, he provided security to the Athletes' Village. In 98, Rick began his work as a supervisor and training coordinator with the Bates College Security Department in Maine. And while there, he co-founded and served as director of the New England Campus Security Training Academy. Uh, and in 2005, Rick took, uh, took on a position as Director of Campus Safety at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts. And in 2009, he accepted this current position at the Milton Hershey School for the Director, Senior Director of Campus Safety and Security. So I'm going I'm to, as George was alluding to, we're going to touch on observational techniques this morning. And Ted Wade actually will be joining for, for the second part of this uh, presentation. And we've kind of broken this up a little bit. Um, with observational techniques, we look at it from almost twofold a little bit, is um, observational techniques from people we don't necessarily recognize, people that are new to us, um, and then also using observational techniques internally, people that we do know, but what are those red flags that we can pick up on, um, those, those self-observations, those sort of self-assessments, and Ted will definitely uh, dive deeper into that. Um, really, in this program that we're going to touch on, this is almost a two-day program that we're going to do in about 45 minutes. Um, so we're going to throw a lot of information out at you, but I'm really going to, we're going to capture some key points, certain things that you can take back and, and bring back to your team um, and, and sort of review and discuss and at least start that conversation. The nice thing about this is there's numerous instructors out here in the state that are spot trainers. Um, site protection through observational techniques. I'm one of I'm an instructor. Ted's an instructor. Um, we actually host uh, classes here at the school to bring in more instructors, and we actually we've got one coming up in June that's just about full. So it's one of those things where if you want to bring this back to your church, your your congregation, wherever, you can always reach out. Uh, Louisiana State University puts this on, and they can team you up with an instructor, and we can come out and they can do like a four-hour package, an eight-hour package. But really where we find a lot of value behind this is those frontline people. And that's what we're going to talk about, are those people that are, are set up and uh, that first contact that they have. So like George had said, when you set foot on the park, at any given time before you enter the entranceway, there's people that are observing you. And what are they looking for? And this is where my first taste of this, and I'm kind of excited to be talking to this crowd because I usually talk to students. Um, and I talk about the 96 Olympics and nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. Um, it's just completely, I mean, we're talking, this is five years before they were even born. So, um, so it's kind of nice to have people that understand this a little bit. But I remember I, I was um, part of a law enforcement team and we were assigned to the Athletes Village. And one of our key things, we, we would alternate our patrols, but we would be set up at the checkpoints. And our job was to observe, just observe people coming in. And I remember the first couple days we were there, it was a, their, their training program was a little, little different. Before the, the event actually started, we were set up there just as the athletes were arriving. And really, a lot of the officers, the impression was, I'm in uniform, I'm just going to stand here. And that's all I'm doing. I'm a deterrent, which is great. You are a deterrent. But I remember one of the supervisors coming around when they were doing the training. They were saying, OK, that's great. You're standing here. What are you looking for? 
and I'm looking for something suspicious. Okay, what is that? I don't know. I'll know it when I see it. Really wasn't much to go on. And now meanwhile, you've got hundreds of people coming through. What am I looking for in that crowd of hundreds of people? That's great. I'm standing there. I'm a great deterrent. But aside from that, if there's something going on, I'm not sure. What should I be focusing on? What should I be looking for? And this is where spot training starts to get into that. And once you start looking at it, it's a lot of common sense stuff. But when you're standing there, until you start putting all those common sense pieces together, it doesn't really come together. So we'll touch and we'll dive a little bit into that. Um, Ted, when he comes up, he'll do, uh, he'll do his introduction, talk a little bit about his background. But one of the things we're going to talk about today, and, and we've got a variety of bullets, we're going to talk a little bit about hardening our target. Uh, Chief Harvey will be coming up a little bit later to talk about uh, uh, crime prevention through uh, environmental design. It's an excellent course, and it really focuses on, on sort of hardening that target. How do you secure your location? We're going to talk about what exactly are we looking for. Like we talked about um, uh, when you have those people at those front doors and people are coming through, what are they looking for? Establishing that observational baseline. And baseline is going to be a word I'm going to use over and over again, because that's really what this comes down to is how are you establishing a baseline? What do people use as that baseline to evaluate everybody that's coming through? Um, we're going to talk about red flags. What are some red flags? Um, just because you see a red flag doesn't necessarily mean that this is the incident. It's usually a variety of red flags. But a lot of times after an incident has occurred, people will go back and go through that checklist of red flags and say, yep, that occurred, yep, that occurred, but never put it all together. And we're going to talk about that so you can start to put that together and sort of connect those dots. Um, we'll talk about pre-incident threat identification, behavioral indicators, and then just situational awareness. So again, as you can see from this, we're going to do this in about 45 minutes. So there's going to be a lot of stuff. We really encourage you, just reach out to a SPOT instructor, invite them in, and we'll come out and we'll do a, a more full program and sort of customize it to, to your program. So how do we protect our assets? And I really can't get into observational techniques without touching on this. This is a key thing, sort of as George said, when you talk about like Hershey Park, how, how, do they, how do they protect their asset? And what's an asset for us? So our asset really is our house of worship, our church, mosque, synagogue, chapel, cathedral, whatever you want to call it. That is our asset. And what's in that asset? It's our congregation. It's our people. They are in there. We're there to protect them. This is what this is about. This is why we're all here today. So how do we even begin to start to protect them? And what we look at doing is we start looking at putting layers of security around that asset. And we start generally from the outside. So we'll put out that first layer. That first layer will be through environmental design. And, and Chief Harvey will talk about that. Just outside, how do you have things set up where it's automatically just securing your facility? And you'll be surprised as he goes through this, some of this stuff is so common sense that when you look at it, you're like, huh, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. I can just make this quick little change and I've completely changed the design of my facility in hardening that target and making it more secure. We also start talking about that second ring. What is our access control? So once you're at that facility itself, prior to getting in, what do we have in place? With churches, and I, and, and I get this, this is a welcoming place. We want to keep those doors open. We want people to come in. We want them to feel at home. We're not creating a police state. We're not looking to run people through metal detectors. We want them to be very inviting. We want this, again, to be a place where they come and be comfortable in. But how do we establish our act? How do we find the balance between security and convenience? And where do we find that and still kind of maintain that? So we'll talk a little bit about access control. Cameras are definitely some, uh, we're seeing more and more of that coming up in churches. Not necessarily that they're actively used. In other words, what I mean by that, it's not that we have somebody monitoring them while services are going on. But it's a great tool to go back to and actually review. And there was something that occurred. Let me go back to the video and see what actually took place. But what we are going to focus on today is that inner ring inside your facility, right on the edge, right before people come in. And that's really focusing on our greeters, our ushers, our parishioners themselves. I will tell you, any church I go to, if I travel around and I go to stop a different church, it's almost commonplace before you walk in, you're greeted. There's always somebody there to greet you. Hey, welcome to, you know, Church of Mary or whatever. Welcoming there. I'll walk in. I'll go to sit down. Usually parishioners will look around. Parishioners all know themselves. They all know their, their regulars there. When there's somebody new there, what happens? Parishioners start turning around. Hey, I'm so-and-so. Where are you from? What's your name? Starts introducing me to their family. This is commonplace. This is great. This is a layer of security for you. Your own parishioners. But do they know what they're looking for? Again, you're not expecting, we're not looking to give uh, in-depth training necessarily, but 
are there red flags that they're picking up on? And once they know those red flags, what are they doing with them? Do they know who they should be talking to? And then just general information, uh, again, in general of any potential threats that you may have. And Ted will dive in a little bit more into that as far as the, the intel um, side of things. So as we look at that is, what are we training our people to do? What sort of activity are we looking for? When they're standing there, they're there to greet. They're an usher, they're ushering them to their seats, greet people. But aside from that, what else are they there to do? So we're expecting them to be that layer of security, but have we sort of trained them to say, hey, listen, this is something that you need to keep an eye out for, or this is something that, when we talk about baselines, sort of fits in with everything. Our goal really is to evaluate characteristics prior to them getting to us. So even as a, as a greeter and usher at the door, when people are coming towards my church, I wanna be able to start picking up on things as I scan the crowd, as I scan people coming through. When you guys were all coming through, and I'll use um, today's event as, as uh, an example uh, throughout this presentation. When you guys were all coming in through the door and you're standing by the table, that's what I'm doing is, yes, I'm looking to see, do I know people? But I'm scanning the crowd. There's a lot of people here. You're on our campus. It's part of my job to sort of keep our, our community safe, keep you safe, and I'm gonna be looking around and I'm establishing a baseline at this point. I'm looking at what's the common theme I'm seeing and what is gonna stand outside of that theme that I'm gonna start to put a focus on. And then again, as we said, establishing that baseline. So how do we establish a baseline? What type of event? So today, we have a security event. This is a security topic on houses of worship. So my baseline is, I'm understanding, I'm gonna see probably a lot of administrators from different churches. Um, I hate to say it, but it's generally older people, probably in their 40s, 50s to probably older. I probably won't see anybody 30 or under, but I'm already starting to establish that baseline. Um, on top of that, what sort of attire am I gonna see? And as people are coming through, I'm starting to see it's more of a casual attire. So that's fine. If I start seeing people start showing up in coveralls from FedEx or something, you know, it's gonna be a little bit of a red flag. This isn't part of my group. That's someone I might focus in on a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm already starting to establish my baseline at that point. What's the length of my event necessarily? Um, today I know it's an all day event. You go back home, is your event a church service? Is it a church picnic? What type of crowd? What are they gonna be wearing? What are they gonna be bringing with them? Are they gonna be bringing backpacks? Is it that type of event? Are they bringing coolers? All different things. If I have a church picnic, I'll see somebody bring a cooler. That's part of my baseline. If I'm having a church service and someone shows up with a cooler, that's outside of my baseline. That's something that I'm establishing as suspicious at that point. Doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it's part of that baseline and it's outside of that area. That starts to pique my interest. Locations. Where is the event? So we'll take this event for example. We're at Catherine Hall, we're up on the hill, parking's down at the parking garage. Other than that, there's no other parking around. We have gates at the front, back gates open to let you in. So I'm seeing people come from the parking garage. If I see people walking from the roadway coming in, that changes my baseline. Because of our location, I'm expecting you to come from this direction. If you're coming from down the road, that's outside my baseline. Where did you come from? Where is your vehicle? Were you dropped off? Did you leave your vehicle out there? Um, and if so, why? That's kind of odd. Again, that's establishing my baseline. So while I'm standing there looking at the crowd, these are things that I'm putting together. And my baseline may go up, may go down, depending on the crowd. And then weather. Weather is always a key factor, and this is a great thing. And we're gonna we're gonna watch some a few videos here uh, shortly, and we'll talk a little bit about when you're establishing that baseline. Some of the stuff is just easy giveaway giveaways. So today, I'm expecting people to be coming in with jackets and whatnot. If someone showed up without a jacket and a T-shirt, it's not necessarily I'd be suspicious, but that would catch my attention. I think it would catch anybody's attention. If it was July and you showed up with a jacket on, it's outside my baseline. That captured my attention. I may be a little more observant at that point of why does that person have a jacket? Are they trying to cover something? Um, especially if you see that person, they're sweating or things like that. I mean, those are signs of potentially being nervous and everything else. But on top of that, again, they're keeping that jacket on. There's something that's piquing my interest at that point. That's crossed my baseline now. So I've got a quick video. I'll play the video and then it's gonna play again from different angles and we're gonna stop and we're just gonna discuss a few things and we'll talk about the different layers of security they had and then what was their baseline and what might have stood outside of that baseline.
Okay. So obviously you guys saw the video. I'm sure you picked up on certain things. <clears throat> Let's look at the first step. What are my layers of security? When we talk about environmental design, you've got your stanchions that they have set up. They've kind of, not a big thing, but clearly as you show up, that sort of starts to corral people and starts to funnel them through to one entrance. So if I'm showing up at this event, I know as far as all the doors that I can use, that's the door, because it's already directed me in that, in that area. So that alone is already a layer of security. It's not much, but it's starting to control things, and that control is part of the security. Other things that I have in place is I've got an individual checking bags. His primary purpose is to look at bags as they come through. I've got another individual, his primary purpose is to scan tickets. So I've got my environmental side with the stanchions, and I, when you look at greeters, ushers, whatever, I've already got two people at that entranceway. It's not bad, actually, I've got one door, I've got some environmental sort of barriers there, and I've got two individuals that are clearing people coming through. You would think that would be suitable. Okay, so if I'm creating a baseline, I'm looking at this, I'm looking, I'm seeing people showing up in shorts, t-shirts, it looks like it rained outside, but the rain's cleared up, I'm not seeing umbrellas, jackets, if I'm gonna scan this crowd, who's gonna stand outside of my baseline? Clearly, I've got the individual off to the side here. He's got a jacket on, he's got a backpack, not necessarily a big deal, people are bringing bags all the time, but the way this individual's dressed is sparking my, my attention now. Clearly, it's warm out, it's hot. Why does this individual have a jacket? Could have a legitimate reason, but he's outside that baseline at this point. Another thing that's outside my baseline is this gentleman right here. Now granted, all he's doing is looking at his phone, could be waiting for people, and that's completely legitimate. We see that all the time. But he's not necessarily coming in. So I'm still gonna sort of be observant on that individual. So I've got two people really that I'm watching. I've got one that I'm definitely keeping an eye on, but then I've got another individual that I'm not sure where it's gonna go, but I wanna make sure that he stays on my radar. Okay. My primary person here that I'm sort of observing has now dropped off a backpack along the side there. So that could tell me one of two things. One, he's also been standing and watching that entryway. He's seeing bags are being searched. There's a reason why he doesn't want to bring that bag in. Um, and, you know, working at schools and everything, we see that with our students. It's not necessarily they don't want to see their backpacks, but students will leave backpacks here and there, and that's commonplace. We see that all the time. But in this particular case, you've got a person that's trying to, you know, it looks like they want to gain entry, but now they're leaving their backpack outside. Um, and they're putting it, obviously not next to them, they're putting it up against the wall. That starts to raise my awareness level. Those are different red flags that are going up. So I really have two red flags at this point. The way he's dressed and what he's done right now. The part that concerns me though is, with my environmental design and my two people there, my ticket taker right now is focused on his job of being a ticket taker. But is he trained to observe other things? Because really, this is all occurring while he's standing there. And you'll notice throughout the video, he hasn't picked up on any of this, nor does he react to it. Our bag searchers focus on searching bags. So my secondary subject at this point has kind of now come off my baseline. I've seen him meet his people. It looks like he was part of a group. They're coming in, they have their tickets. We're good to go. My primary person now, still to this point, as you can see, hesitation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's some, what we call self-grooming, playing with his jacket, playing with his pockets, sort of fixing his attire, constantly looking around. Is anybody watching him? Now watch, he'll observe people behind him, sweating. Now the benefit of something like this, even though nobody picked up on it, those individuals that were there were enough of a deterrent to turn that individual away. 
where we want to get is we want to get to the next level that we are actually observing and we know that this is going on. So as I said, some of this stuff, when you watch the video, immediately it stands out. You see it. But when you're actually out there standing there, preoccupied with other things, these are things that we all miss. It's common sense stuff, but we miss those type of things just because a lot of times we don't realize that this is what we should be doing. So what could raise red flags? Baggage inconsistent with appearance. Um, for example, you guys all came in today. Um, some of you had purses. I think a couple had a, a few backpacks. Uh, they were keeping books in there. If you were to show up with a duffel bag, a suitcase, that would raise my awareness level. When I came in this morning, and this, this uh, human resources actually had some material, and when you leave here, there's a table for the Milton Hershey School and there's some material out there. They carry their material in a big rolling suitcase. And I always, when I carry it around, I feel odd because I know I stand out at this point because I'm the guy rolling the big suitcase behind them. That just stands out. I'd rather have it in a box, but it's just the way it is. And actually, it does make it a lot easier to carry, but I stand out. Um, but if somebody else were showing up with a suitcase, unless you were a presenter, that would raise my baseline at this point. Uh, stiff posture, minimal body movement, um, and uh, some of the, I think we have another video that kind of shows that, where an individual had something either in his sleeve, up against his side, down his pant leg, and when he was moving, you could tell there was limited movement. Now, that could mean there could be some sort of injury or, or, or a disability somewhere, but that's just something where you observe, and then you sort of assess, and then you move on. Wearing improper attire, as we saw in this individual, looks like a nice summer day, people are in shorts, beautiful weather, this guy's out here with a jacket, at one point you actually see him sweating. What's that, what's that red flag there? Clock watching, if you've got somebody in an event constantly looking at their watch, aside from me, who's making sure I don't go over my time, um, but people always looking at their watch. Head turning, looking at my watch, but now turning around, who's watching me at this point? Is there anything else coming up behind me? Is, is this now my time to make that move? When you saw that individual standing there and he was waiting in line, what happened? Other people came up behind him. He noticed that right away. Everybody else, you're just standing in line. You're focused on getting in. This guy's focused on who's around him and who's watching him at that point. And hesitation prior to entering. You even saw this as a prime example in the video. Before you go, uh, other people came. No, go ahead. He wants to make sure he has a clear pathway in. And now, right now, towards the end, he had people show up and he just sort of abandoned his mission. So in looking at all this, it's easy to get distracted even as you create that baseline of, I'm looking at a crowd of 300 people. Oh, that person looks suspicious. They've raised that baseline. It's a summer day. They're wearing a, a winter parka, pulling a suitcase. Um, there's bomb wicks hanging out of their pocket. Everything's there. I'm focused on him. I still got 300 other people around me. How do I not know they're associated with somebody? How do I not know there's something else going on? How do I not know this is just a distraction? So it's more or less, once you create your baseline, you observe them, you still gotta monitor the rest of your group. You still gotta keep an eye on what's happening.
Okay, when this started, this video came out, how many of you started watching this guy up in the top right hand corner? The majority of the people. I mean, that was pretty obvious. He's coming down. Where's my baseline? He's dressed like everybody else. The only thing that really stands out to me at this point is the fact that he's not pulling around a suitcase. Doesn't have a carry-on, doesn't have anything. That's kind of odd to see today's day and age, especially when you're flying. Uh, I was just flying earlier, two, three days ago. People are trying to bring all kinds of stuff onto the airplane because you don't want to check it in anymore. I get it. Um, I would much rather travel with nothing. I just want to make sure I get my stuff when I get off the plane, and that's the challenge. But in this case here, individual doesn't have anything. It's odd to see somebody walking around with nothing, but it's not that big of a deal. He's dressed like everybody else. What did catch my eye, and that's when I first saw this video, was the fact when he took out his phone, he's had his phone, and at one point you see a picture. You see him, you know, almost he holds it sideways. That was odd to me. That stands out a little bit. And if you're observing something, that would be something I would immediately start watching. But what happens is, and I, I'll use myself as an example, when I started watching this, my focus went straight to him, and I was focused on him. I didn't want to miss anything. Now, I continue to focus on him, but at one point lost focus on that individual. And for everybody who was watching, how many, how many people were still focused on this guy here, but had forgotten to start watching him or missed that part when he got up? Yes, because now we're, we're almost tunnel visioned on this individual. Clearly, our first guy is doing a lot of suspicious behavior at this point. My baseline is all over the place because I'm looking at him. Why is he touching the gut? Why would you touch the garbage can like that? Why would you lift the lid on that? There's so many things that are going on. The only time for me when it shifted things around was when he held that camera to take that picture and I decided to look down the hall and see what's he taking a picture of. Then, then that, that's when I saw that individual. Had he not taken that picture, I would have still been focused on this person. And meanwhile, look at your cameras. What's happening over here? You've got somebody else who's now testing the security features, their access control into those areas. and then they walk off into the sunset. Um, and he actually snaps one more picture as he's leaving. I don't know if you guys had observed initially, the individual that was sitting down, it looks like he was drawing a sketch when he was there. Again, not necessarily that's completely odd, but when you start putting all those together, start taking all those red flags, connect the dots, it turns into something much bigger. And that's where when we talk about focusing, creating our baseline, is making sure that we understand what we're looking for, but we're also connecting all those dots. Just because something looks suspicious or is odd doesn't mean that it's something bad. There's plenty of odd people out there, trust me. We see them every day. It doesn't mean they're doing anything bad. Um, but it's when you start seeing a variety, a, a you know, systematic sort of odd behavior that continues on, at what point do we start putting all those dots together and saying, listen, I need to have a little bit more of a focus here. And this is where our ushers, our greeters, our parishioners, they're there. Do they know that they should be keeping an eye out for this? But making sure that they fully understand, and, and I can't stress this enough, just because someone's acting a little different doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. But it's just more or less something that you need to put on your radar. This is what we're looking for. So what are some, some additional red flags to consider? Asking odd questions, especially security related. Today, if people come up to me and start asking me about security systems, things along those lines, not really all that odd. This is what we're here for today. This is the topic we're talking about. My baseline's already set there that this is gonna be our conversation. If it was outside of this, and somebody asked me about security, yeah, I'm the senior director of security, that's a common question. Start asking me a little bit more in-depth knowledge of, hey, how does your cameras work? Does it pick up on motion? Um, your access control, if I uh, you know, force entry through a door, does it set off an internal alarm? Okay, valid questions, but I'm a little more curious now. Why are you asking me this? I'll answer, I may be a little vague in my answer, but I may start asking you questions back because now I'm starting to judge where am I at with you? What's my baseline? Are you just generally interested because where you're coming from, you wanna look at this? Or is it something now that's standing out because you're looking to test our systems? And that leads right into testing our security. 
So when we talk about access control and we've got areas that are sort of open to uh, our congregation, our parishioners, this, these are the areas people are supposed to, to be in, but now you find people that are randomly or especially same individual sort of wandering off in areas that they're really not supposed to be in, trying doors. Um, what are they doing? Why are they there? Um, are they testing our systems? Photography, that's, that's always a big one. For us, uh, using our campus, I mean, we're on almost 12,000 acres is the size of our campus. We have facilities everywhere. We're open to the, to the public. We're an open campus. We've got Founders Hall. We have a trolley that drops people off there. People are taking pictures of Founders Hall. That's all expected. When I see that, that does not change anything on my baseline. We have Alumni Grove that's right across from Founders Hall. People are always taking pictures there. Again, doesn't really change anything on my baseline. That person now turns around, starts taking pictures of a student home. My baseline's now changed. That's outside of my area. Why are you focused on that student home now? Why are you taking pictures of that? Starting to take pictures of not Founders Hall, but the doors of Founders Hall. Changes things on my baseline. Start taking pictures of emergency exits, taking pictures of cameras that might be visible, um, any of our systems. Um, those are all things that now you've crossed outside of just what would be generally normal to something that's abnormal. And I'm gonna start paying attention to that. And then observation and surveillance. Um, your, your greeters, your ushers, when they're actually set up and they're standing at the doorway and people are coming in, cars are pulling into the parking lot, um, at red Ford Fiesta sorts of pulls in, parks. Church is about to start, that red car pulls out, drives off. Okay, put that on my radar, that was kind of odd. You know, were they pulling over, were they waiting for somebody, looking to make a phone call? Next Sunday comes around, you're standing there, that red Ford Fiesta pulls up, parks. Everybody comes in, they drive off. Red flag starts coming up. That's twice. Now, not only is that twice, but is my greeter there, are they observing to those type of things? Are they scanning the area and are they seeing that? And are they mentally making a note saying, hey, that's odd because I saw that yesterday because I knew as of yesterday or as of last week, I need to start creating baselines. And that sort of, sort of sparked something on my radar. Now it's definitely jumped it up. What's up with that red car? Why is that two weeks in a row now that they're sitting there? Are they observing? Are they observing how people are coming in into, uh, into the church? Are they looking for somebody? Are they waiting to see if somebody's going to attend the church? Those are areas that I'm going to sort of be looking at at this point. And that when we talk about surveillance, that's, that's a prime thing. When I see people that are just sitting there, um, there's people watching, and then you can tell it's outside that people watching. And again, it's all about creating that baseline. Um, so, you know, people say, all right, Rick, I've established a baseline, this person's way off the baseline, he's, he's hit every single red flag on the checklist, um, everything's pinging on me, uh, what do I do? Uh, you can do a variety of things, and this is where a lot of, in your case, your parishioners and things like that, greeters, ushers, it's expected that you're going to talk to people. So when you go up and you see that, what's wrong with going up and just start talking to the individual? Hey, how are you? You know, um, have you ever been here before? Trying to ask a little bit those open-end questions. Are you from the area? You know, are you visiting? Who are you visiting? Do you know anybody that goes to this church? Oh yeah, who, do, who is it? Um, are you here to see somebody? Who are you here to see? Do you know where you're going? Asking them those questions, and what we're looking for is we're looking for, as we had talked about the, uh, the earlier individual that we saw trying to get in, you know, that grooming side of things. You start approaching somebody, somebody's getting nervous. They start tucking their shirt in, touching their hair. I used to have hair, but you know, running your hair through your hair. Um, but those are self-grooming, and, and when you start to establish a baseline, when you talk to someone, you can almost start picking up when people are being somewhat dishonest, because you can talk to them, and they'll be start looking at you, and you're having that conversation, and the moment they're starting to be dishonest, you'll notice that baseline, their characteristics start to change a little bit. That eye contact will break, may start touching the ear, may start touching their face. There's these, these, this human nature of things that starts to change because they're uncomfortable with it. So to break that tension, to break that anxiety, they'll start to make different gestures that they don't even realize they're doing. So there's certain things, with my kids, this happens all the time. I can, and they, it's not that they lie to me, they're young kids, but when they start talking and there's certain things they'll do, I know immediately, all of you that have kids, you know right away when your child is not being honest with you. And why is that? Because you've already established a baseline with your child where you know when they're being dishonest. And this is what we're hap what's happening here, except we're just doing it very quickly. Averts gaze, we'll try to look away. Uh, displays more foot or leg movement. I've got one individual that, uh, that I deal with, and I'm sure we all know that person, 
where you can tell when they start getting nervous because they'll be sitting there and all of a sudden that leg starts going 100 miles a minute where it's bouncing on their foot. We all know those individuals. Um, or they start fidgeting with their hands. There's a lot more movement and it's that anxiety and that's the way they let it out is by doing those type of gestures. Um, stutters or is hesitant to respond, um, lacks detail of story. Uh, repeating the question, that's a common thing. Hey, are you from the area? Uh, am I from the area? That's stuff where they're just trying to think of the answer because they weren't prepared for that. They're focused on doing this. You've now distracted them. Now they need to come up with a new story. They need to figure out what their answer is. So that's not a common, and I guarantee with kids, and I'll tell you with my kids, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw them under the bus, that's how I know. Because I'll ask them a question and they'll repeat the same question to me. And I know you heard the question. We're not confirming it. I just want the answer now. Um, and then lacks details in the story. When you start asking them questions and it just doesn't make sense then at that point those are little red flags. And now it's a matter of when you have that, what do you do with it? Who do you talk to? Um, what do you have established within, within your house of worship, within your congregation? Who do you consult with when you need to review these type of things? And when do you bring other people in? So at this point, um, oh, moves away from interviewer. Actually, this, this is kind of a key one in places objects in between them. If I'm talking to somebody and they're answering me and they're walking away, um, it's a little bit of a red flag of A, they don't wanna talk to me, it's a little odd, where are they going? I'm gonna watch them for a little bit. Um, I know when I was in law enforcement, that was one of the things where if I'm talking and asking you questions, but you're continuing to walk away, a little bit of a red flag. Are you about to run away from me? Um, if you're starting to place objects and I'm talking to you, but now I'm gonna start to answer your questions, but I'm gonna start putting the podium between you and I, okay, that's a red flag. Something may be about to happen. Doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's something bad, but it's again, it's those red flags that you start to evaluate. So. At this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. Ted's gonna actually focus a little bit more on the, the behavioral side of things, um, the assessment side, and really looking internally of what you should be sort of watching for. All right, uh, I'm uh, Ted Way. I'm a security consultant and trainer. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor. I teach security and counterterrorism for Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical University for their worldwide campus. Um, and you know, I'm also very heavily involved with uh, ASIS International. I'm the regional vice president for them. That's a security management association. So it's all the security directors and security executives around the world uh, is who are members of that organization. Um, and uh, I've also been heavily involved with the task force for about 14 years now as a trainer uh, with the group. Uh, but I come to this from a slightly different perspective. Um, I went in the Army back during uh, the Reagan era, and at that point, we didn't do any counterterrorism training for, for people in the military. And a few years later, I found myself in the Middle East getting a block of instruction on how to run a mirror under a vehicle to look for a car bomb at our facility that we were at. And my first question is, okay, what happens if we find a car bomb? And the sergeant that was running the class his answer was pretty simple. Well, everybody back there is gonna be real happy that it detonated up here. <laughs> that kind of motivates you to try to figure out, okay, how do I detect it out there? How do I detect it the day before it happens? How do I detect it to the left of Vang, as we like to say? So that's the perspective I approach, and we have a lot of different threats that we have to deal with uh, within organizations. Some of that exterior threat, somebody you've never met before walking into your facility that's posing a threat. Maybe it's an arson, maybe it's an active shooter, uh, whatever the situation is. But there's a full spectrum to the insiders, the people who are already in your organization that uh, pose a threat. So how do we detect them? There's also the case where you have individuals who are affiliated with somebody that's an insider somebody in your congregation and they have a domestic situation with that person in your congregation or they have a grudge against that person uh, or they have a grudge against your entire congregation for whatever reason and you know this because they're in your community and they've made it public. So there's a lot of indicators we can look at beforehand. Um, one of them to talk about is the Texas uh, church shooting that occurred last year. Um, when that individual came in, he had a long-term grudge with members of the congregation. They were his ex-wife's parents and believed he was coming to look for them. But one of the shocking factors is that when he walked into the church before he started shooting, 
one of the parishioners was overheard saying, that's him. That's him. They knew who he was. They suspected he was a threat. And until he showed up that day, it wasn't resolved. It wasn't taken care of. And we're going to look at what we can do about that kind of situation. Because uh, obviously, we want to prevent the attack. That's the way we have nobody hurt if we prevent the attack. Um, and when it comes to a lot of different motives, it can be personal, it can be ideological, it can be a mental health issue. These individuals give off warning signs months, days, years before they conduct their attacks. Uh, you know, even with the school shooter down in Parkland, they knew that kid was a threat for years. They knew he was a problem for years, and they didn't successfully mitigate the risk and the threat that he posed. So these individuals will post things on social media, they'll make comments. Uh, very often we'll hear afterwards, he was a nice, quiet boy, uh, but when you get down to it, he was quiet because every time he opened his mouth, he said something that offended or shocked people. So they are withdrawn. Very often these people aren't loners as much as they are failed joiners. And they build up grudges against all the groups they don't get to join or all the people who no longer want to be associated with them. Um, so uh, when they're planning these events, though, they give us an opportunity. Um, we've seen a lot of shootings since, Par or shootings since Parkland that were prevented because somebody saw a warning sign. They had a map of the school with their plan on it. They had a list of all the people they wanted to get, and this gave an opportunity for a parent or a grandparent or a friend to find this and warn somebody before it happened and have the attack prevented. Um, and you know, this is really what we want to focus on uh, when it comes to people that are interacting with your organization is that you can see it coming and you can prevent it. So uh, we got to focus on suspicious behavior, not suspicious people. If I ask my nine-year-old what a, what a stranger is that they should avoid, I'm not going to get a real good definition. We tell our kids not to talk to strangers, not to interact with strangers, because they might be dangerous. But most kids couldn't tell you what a stranger is. They'll go off, well, they're, they're probably really ugly, and they're mean, and they don't. And the most dangerous strangers are the ones that aren't ugly and mean. They've learned to camouflage who they are and what they are. Um, many of these individuals have long-term grievances and hatred. Uh, we often refer to them as grievance collectors. They have a mental or physical list of everybody that's done them wrong. And when these individuals go into a crisis mode, a mental health crisis, their life's falling apart, sometimes they decide that the only thing they can control is who goes out with them. So they want to make other people suffer along with them so they can lash out. And that's what a lot of these active shooter and other incidents are, lashing out to punish everybody else so they suffer along with them. And there's a lot of different things that can trigger this. Mental uh, health issues, and they can snowball because they lose a lot of their other support networks through this. They, they lose their family relationships, personal relationships. And substance abuse issues also kick in, too, because uh, a lot of these people are trying to treat their mental health issues or their depression by burying themselves in substances, substances that lower their judgment, their decision-making, and all of these other factors that can make them much more dangerous than they were. And that suicidal or homicidal thoughts or expression, if somebody's talking about killing themselves or talking about harming other people, listen to it. They may mean it. And this is when he talks about baseline. You know, some people, they just rant. Some people mean it. And you've got to listen to try to figure out which is which, but you've got to take them seriously. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Because most of these active shooters enough are, are suicidal. Okay, if you couldn't handle being picked on in school, if you couldn't handle being picked on on the shop floor, if you can't you know, handle you know, being bullied, you're not going to enjoy prison. Okay, so most of these individuals don't plan to survive their attacks. Um, and it's very much just they're trying to lash out at others before they go. 
Um, there's also a lot of behavioral indicators to look for. Um, individuals that have a, a history of excessive anger. We all get mad. For 11 years, I commuted from York to Harrisburg up I-83. Right? A couple times a week, I was mad at somebody. Right? Did I rear-end them? No. Was I still mad at them five hours later? No. So what you're talking, we're talking about here is somebody who gets way too mad about way too little for way too long. And that's what we're trying to look for because those individuals turn those into grudges. They, somebody wronged them 20 years ago and they're still mad at them. They still talk about it. They won't let it go. Um, and you know, they also tend to blame everybody else for their problems. No, no action they've ever take has caused their misfortunes. It's always somebody else blaming them. Every human being has that trait. We're all capable of doing it, but it's the person who blames everybody for everything and wants to get revenge against those people because their life is having difficulties. Um, and very often, these people are socially isolated. Their family has given up on them. Their spouse has given up on them. Their friends have given up on them. Their parents have given up on them. Uh, or worse, they're coddling them. They're enabling them. Uh, we saw with the Sandy Hook shooter, his mother knew he was dangerous. He had threatened for a long time because she worked at the Sandy Hook school and he had threatened to go to the school and kill those kids because he knew it was psychological torture to do, tell her that, that he was going to kill the kids she loved and went to school with every day. And eventually, he did it. But he developed that grudge and that angle he used to, to lash out and get revenge against her. Uh, personal problems. Uh, the, the Parkland shooter in Florida, uh, if you weren't aware, his mother passed away a few months ago, towards the end of 2017, and he went from being a probably dangerous individual who had somebody looking out for him to somebody who had just lost the primary caregiver in his life, his support network, and he's going through all this grief, dealing with his mental health issues, he was lost, couldn't find help. At one point, he even called the police, called 911, and reported himself. That's a cry for help. And very often, these individuals making threats are doing it as a cry for help. And when nobody listens, that builds into their grievances, that process that they're going through. Uh, the biggest thing to look for, uh, we talk about an unhealthy fascination with weapons in these events. We're in central Pennsylvania, okay? Lots of people own weapons. Lots of people carry weapons. Um, lots of people use weapons for hunting and other things, self-defense, but it's that unhealthy fascination. It's not, hey, I bought this new rifle to go target shooting. It's, hey, I bought this new rifle and I could mow down 50 people if I wanted to. Very different approach. My brother has a shirt he wears to the range sometimes that says, I called off work because the voices told me to stay home and clean the guns. He's joking, but he'd be on my watch list if I didn't know any better, <laughs> okay? So it's that unhealthy issue, and very often these individuals study these incidents. It becomes a fixation for them, uh, and they follow these shootings in the news. They research them. They categorize them. They learn tactics from them. They even network online. We had a school shooting in Pennsylvania uh, interrupted a couple of years ago because the kid was discussing tactics online with another kid from Germany who did a school shooting. And as they were investigating the kid from Germany, they found the internet communications as they were sharing ideas and tactics for how to attack their schools. Okay. Um, and when we look at the, uh, the Charleston shooter, and I try not to use the shooter's names, they like the publicity, I don't want to give it to them. So the shooter with the church in Charleston, uh, who was convicted last year, you know, he was posting stuff on social media that made his intentions very clear, that he hated other groups, that he wanted to pose a threat to them, 
that he wanted to start a, a race war. And he was quite clear in his attempt, intent. Nobody was paying attention. Nobody was watching it and looking at those warning signs that are out there. And the big thing is a change in behavior. That's like one of those really bad clues when somebody's going through a crisis. Maybe they've lost their job, they've lost their home, they've lost a family member, they've kind of lost their mental health uh, stability, and their behavior changes. So they go from being a loud, outgoing person, and now they're just quiet, sitting off by themselves. Or they went from being, you know, a very loner type person, and now they're interacting with everybody, but usually in a hostile way. So the change in behavior is often an indicator of that, that future action that they're looking at doing. Um, their mental health state is deteriorated, um, and they're actually contemplating this, and they're starting to express it, and they're leaking out verbally and on social media what they're fantasizing about doing in their mind. So then these triggering events will set them off. Um, very often, an individual will slide up and down the threat scale. Today, they may scream and yell. Tomorrow, they may kick the door and pound the desk. The next day, they may rip something off the wall. Another day, they may punch somebody. The next day, they're in a good mood. They're back to just screaming and yelling, or nothing. And depending on how provoked they are, they slide back and forth on this threat scale, from no threat, to a verbal threat, to a property threat, to a threat to people. And the stimuli that you know, affects them is very unpredictable. So you have to watch their behavior to detect it. But these incidents often push them, you know, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. People don't just snap. They've been on this route for a long time, and this was just the last thing. And it may be the 20th last thing. A lot of these individuals have gone to the site with the weapon in their vehicle multiple times and didn't go through with their, their attack. But maybe this time they do. All right. Restraining orders are a big one. Uh, you know, they're very useful, protection from abuse orders here in Pennsylvania at, at trying to protect somebody, some bringing some legal sanction in uh, in domestic violence cases, but very often this will trigger the individual you know, we had a personal conflict, this is our family conflict, and now you brought the judge and the police into our family conflict? And that escalates things to a whole new level, because very often domestic violence is about control, and now you just brought a judge and the police into the control situation, and they're not in control anymore. And they may try to reassert it aggressively. Um, and copycats. Uh, these news articles, whenever the, one of these big events happens, an attack on a church, an attack on a school, um, a lot of people who are thinking about it say, look at all the media attention this person got. They're famous. They've been on the, their face has been on the, uh, on the news for a week now. And it triggers more people to go out and, and do it or to contemplate it. And sometimes people who are just looking for help will say something now because they know somebody will take it serious and they may actually get the help that they need. Um, and some of the biggest things is, you know, we've got to see something, we've got to say something, we've got to do something, okay? Too often we know these individuals are a threat or somebody in our congregations do and we don't do anything about it. I wish our official communications networks worked as well as our rumor mills did. Okay, and that's in every organization. So we've got to be tapped into those rumor mills of what's going on. But we've also got to let our people know that, hey, if you hear a rumor about somebody that poses a threat, we need to be aware of that. Law enforcement needs to be aware of that. And we need to work together to try to mitigate this threat. Um, and, you know, when we, when we talk about suspicious behavior, um, we really want to focus, and this will help with communicating things to law enforcement too, is the demeanor, is how the person acts, and their conduct, what they're doing. Because you know, very often law enforcement will get calls, well, this person made some vague threat to the organization. 
But all those other red flags, hey, this person has been making threats for a long time, this person's behavior is escalating, uh, this person has done physical violence in the past, um, all of those factors add up and can help law enforcement take the issue more seriously or understand it. Um, so being able to understand how they're acting and what they're doing um, helps them uh, establish probable cause to get involved or reasonable suspicion to do so and look at it. Um, and you know, if their conduct and their demeanor isn't typical, we got to investigate, we got to look at it. Whether that's your, your church security team, whether that's your local law enforcement that you're bringing in to help, um, somebody's got to have an eye on this and recognize the problem. Um, because it's great to be prepared for these situations. It's even better if we're prepared to prevent them. And that's one of the focuses we have to get. And to do that, we need the eyes and ears of everybody in our organizations to do that. 